Hi, this is Julie Lubinsky, and I'd like to welcome you to the November before Thanksgiving um, special of chatting live with Nurse Linda. Um, and let's, uh, we're going to kick off today's topic talking about catheters. And I want to remind you that if you have any questions, you feel free to type them in the chat box if you're joining us on, on the web portion where you will also be given the opportunity to ask your question um, if you're joining us um, through the telephone as well. So I would like to kick it off to Linda to get us started off. Um, hi, Linda. Hi, Julie, and good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to be here on the uh, couple of days before Thanksgiving. I know we're all anxiously looking forward to that time uh, with family and friends. And speaking of friends, I last month went to the Rehab Nurses Association conference, which is a wonderful opportunity to meet all kinds of people that are interested in all aspects of rehabilitation. And while I was there, there of course was a lot of talk and conversation about bladder programs and catheters. And so I thought, well, let's just talk about that a little bit on the blog because there's always a lot of questions about those kinds of things. Um, just talking first about the products themselves, there's such an overwhelming amount of um, hype and publicity and advertisements about different catheters. And so a lot of people always have a lot of questions about am I using the right catheter? Um, you know, would there be something better for me to use? And of course, there's, it's, there's just so much information about this catheter and that kind of catheter and then the kits that they come in and all kinds of information. So I thought let's just talk a little bit about catheters today. And so um, there, there were, uh, at the conference, there were a huge number of suppliers and products, and they show us the latest and the greatest. It's always interesting to see because I know that people are going to be asking me about these products and which would be the best to use. So just to start out, um, the basic uh, catheter that's used in most facilities is the one that we just call the red rubber catheter. I'm sure that everybody has seen this somewhere along their uh, line if they're doing catheterization. And so uh, the red rubber catheter is one that has been useful for a number of years. It's uh, durable. It's, used, it's a multiple use catheter. And so it's just uh, cleaned and then um, sterilized or sanitized in some way and it can be used over and over again. Now, a lot of times uh, the type of catheter that you can have or the product that you can use is indicated uh, to you by your payer because they'll be looking for the uh, product that offers the best quality of care at the cheapest uh, price of care. So the red rubber is the traditional. And I'm sure that we have many people in the community that are using the red rubber catheters. They're wonderful, durable little um, uh, bladder draining equipment. It's a good product. Uh, it's fabulous to use. People have used them for a number of years, so I'm sure we have a lot of, of people listening that are actually using that red rubber catheter. And so um, I, I was talking to uh, actually a, a, a a young woman the other day, and uh, she was telling me about her father who had a, a spinal cord injury. And she said, really, in our home there was no differentiation between him or anyone else because what had happened was um, that he just kept his uh, catheter, th there was a little... Um, pan on the back of the kitchen stove and he just kept his catheter there in the back of the kitchen uh, stove and um, it just, he boiled it when he needed to and it just was, you know, the way that things operated in their home so it was, became no big deal. And it got me thinking about, isn't that interesting that it just was, you know, natural part of life, this was just the way he operated. It, Nobody looked at it oddly or anything. So kind of interesting. So I'm seeing a little survey that's going on, and a lot of people have not tried the red rubber catheter. 
I, you know, I, I'm not recommending that you change what you're doing, but I just thought we might have a lot of people in our community um, that would that would be using that. So a question has come in, up about what's the best method to clean or sterilize catheters. And that's a very good question because the red rubber is one that is reusable. And so um, people need to do that. And, and what they'll actually do is they'll um, get a dedicated pan to their, you know, just for this purpose. You don't want to be mixing your catheter supplies with your eating supplies. So um, get a, a, a pan and put some water in it. You put the catheter in and uh, let the um, pan come to a rolling boil with the water. And then you do that, for, uh, let it boil for 15 minutes. Then when it's finished, you can drain the water out of the pan, let the pan cool, drain the water, and then just uh, keep it covered in that pan. Or you can take the catheter out and put it in a bag like a um, pillowcase that is, you know, lets air travel through it. And then you can store your catheter and let it air dry in that bag. So that's one way. Um, other people do other things. Some people will take the catheter and when they wash their hands after their procedure, they just get the catheter washed with soap and water. And then they can go ahead and reuse that. They'll keep the catheter um, in uh, like a toothbrush holder, not just the clip that goes over the top bristles of the toothbrush, but like a uh, toothbrush holder that holds the entire toothbrush and store it in there. They have little vents in the bottom that lets the air circulate in there. So generally that's what people do to clean their catheters one way or another. Now there are a lot of modern catheters on the market. Some are different. Um, we want to be careful of developing any kind of allergies to rubber or rubber products, which is a latex allergy, which was the blog just for this week, and we can talk more about that later. But um, so many people have gone to the silicone catheters, which are kind of a um, bluish, greenish color, or the clear, uh, clear catheters. Um, you want to look to make sure that your catheter is in what they call highly polished, so it has a smooth glide. You always want to use lubricant to make sure that the insertion goes smoothly and easily. You don't want to get a minor tear or cut in your urethra, so you want a polished tip so it's, the catheter slides in easily, and you want polished eyes so nothing uh, grabs at the delicate tissue inside the urethra because you know, as you know, if you have a cut, you have an opportunity for bacteria to enter that cut. And you don't want to have um, any kind of cut or um, discomfort in your urethra. So um, be sure and, and uh, look for the smooth polish. And then there's a variety of um, application products that come with the catheters. What most people will do is they'll just have the catheter, they'll have a tube of lubricant that looks like a tube of toothpaste, but it's got lubricant inside of it. Um, sometimes you can get individual packages that have lubricant for one-time use. But most people just use a tube, squirt oh, some lubricant, don't touch the tube to the catheter, but just squirt some lubricant on the catheter have your hands washed, be sure that you're doing the catheterization in a very clean process, and then catheterize and then remove the catheter and, and off you go. So um, when you're talking about uh, the different catheters, there's all kinds of products. Some catheters will come already lubricated. Some catheters come contained inside a urine disposable disposal bag so that the catheter is threaded up through the bag so you never really touch the catheter. You're touching the bag that, where the urine drains in it. So there's all kinds of different things. Now, all of these different catheters are at different prices. So you have to be very careful about you know, making sure that your payer is going to cover your catheter. So. Um, uh, there's a question about, um, I hope you can discuss the implications of Nurse Practice Acts on state Medicaid home care programs. And yes, I would love to, I would love to talk about that. Um, each state, in, um, you know, as you know, we've talked uh, before, and as you know, um, 
Medicaid is a government program, but it's administrated by each state. So the benefits that you have in one state will not be the same as the benefits somebody else has in another state. So I live right on the border between two states. I live in the state of Missouri, but we have a lot of uh, patients that come from the state of Illinois. And so the benefits for the individuals in Missouri is different, slightly different than the benefits from the individuals in Illinois. So we have to be very aware of what our um, our uh, practice co uh, contains the people that are in our practice. We have to be very aware of the different rules. Some states um, have a five state, some uh, facilities have a, a five state catchment area. So they have to be up on all these different rules from the different states. Um, Medicaid likes to provide care to the patients in the state where they live. So for our Illinois people who would just be like five minutes to cross the border into Missouri, they might have to drive um, hours away to go to a state facility in Illinois. So very complicated, but basically that's the gist of it. So different states will have different rules. Most generally speaking, what happens is people are issued uh, catheters that are used um, in the home using clean technique. Now, uh, it's very, very clean technique because the urinary tract is sterile and we want to keep all the bacteria we can out of there. Um, knowing that just in daily life for anyone, bacteria enters into the bladder. Um, that's why we drink a lot of fluid to keep that flush, to keep the bacteria moving out instead of giving it the opportunity to move in. Um, and then the other thing we want to look at are the types of food and fluids that we do drink. So sugary uh, drinks tend to make the urine uh, more alkaline or, you know, so it doesn't have a lot of acid. Our urine is basically slightly acidic, which helps curb the bacteria growth in our bladders. So um, we, we need to be careful and cognizant of the type of fluid we're taking in. Water will help filter bacteria out as we eliminate urine from our bladder. But we can also pay attention to drinking cranberry juice and apple juice which leaves the urine slightly more acidic, which is very helpful. Now, orange juice, which is an acid when we drink it, comes out as a base when it's eliminated. So orange juice actually is not helpful for our bladder because it reduces the acid in our urine content, so it gives ba uh, bacteria opportunity to grow within our bladder. So I think the question about uh, the Medicaid and uh, use in the catheters. Oh, I think that's a different question altogether. I think, Mike, I'm sorry, I think I've misread your question because my mind is so on catheters. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, continue on with the catheters and then we'll get to your question next. But um, what happens is that some people um, will, regardless of how careful they are with their technique in catheterizing themselves, people oftentimes get bladder infections for which they have to have antibiotic treatment. Um, you can petition if you have a Medicaid provider or if you have a Medicare provider or even private insurance if you have a certain number of infections within a certain period of time. So it's usually two to three infections within a six-month period of time. You can petition to have a higher level of catheter where maybe it's a single use and then you just discard it or um, one of these that come in their own protective insertion packages, which is much more expensive catheter. So you can up your catheter product depending on the number of infections you get. Now that's kind of counterintuitive because what we want to happen is for people not to have infections in the first place. So it's kind of a little backward thinking, but it's the way the process works in that they want people to go ahead and get the infection before they'll up your catheters. Um, in uh, sterility. So it's just kind of something to know about. Um, you can also have your health care provider if you want to avoid infections and you feel like um, 
you might have a problem with that, even though you haven't had an infection yet, if you have some other kind of um, immunosuppression in your system. Having a spinal cord injury is basically uh, having some problems with your immunosuppression because you are so exposing yourself so many times to bacteria doing your catheterizations that you could have your healthcare practitioner write a letter of medical necessity asking for a different catheter. So there's some ways to kind of work around this. Ultimately, it comes down to your payer, um, what, you can, what they are going to afford to pay for you. So um, what does a red rubber catheter look like? It looks just like any other catheter, but it's made out of red rubber. That's why it's uh, called that way. Um, and so the question is um, from one of our uh, respondents here is that they use a straight tip cath. And um, Adrian, I'm, I'm going to assume that you're a female, but Adrian's also a male name, so I'm not quite sure. Um, Females generally use a straight tip cath because they're just going to go straight into the bladder. Now you can buy um, and you can get probably just as easily some of these, they call them female catheters. They're much, much shorter. Male catheters have to be the full length. They're about 12 inches long. They're the standard catheters that we see because the urethra is so much longer because it has to, the, the catheter has to travel through the penis and around the prostate and then up into the bladder. So the, um, uh, the male catheters have to be much, much longer because they have much further to travel, where the female catheters are uh, sometimes just three or four inches long. And you can just insert those right into the urethra and it's just a short, uh, amount of space that you have to traverse till you're in the bladder. So for females, those female catheters are much more convenient. Some of them come in a little uh, uh, tube so that they're pre-lubricated even though you're touching them with your hands. And there's a lot of little niceties that you can use with those. Um, using the female catheters uh, for females is much easier uh, to do when you're on the toilet because they're shorter so the end of the catheter isn't uh, dragging across the toilet seat as the woman's trying to catheterize. However, for males, you need to have that longer catheter. It's not dragging across the toilet seat because you have a longer way to travel internally till you get to that bladder. So the males often use, the question is about the straight tip catheter. Sometimes the males will use what, what is called coude tip. That's C-O-U-D-E pronounced coude tip and so it's a catheter with a, the end of the catheter that's inserted has a little bit of an angle on it and those catheters are used particularly for traversing that that angle around the prostate gland in the male so it gives you a little bit of an edge in getting that catheter to go all the way up now women you just insert the catheter it goes straight into the bladder and pretty much that's all you need to do. Females need to be alerted to the fact that when they open the labia with their other hand, not, not the hand that they're inserting the catheter, but when they open the labia, they want to be careful that they just open the labia, move it from side to side. What I notice a lot of females tend to do is they'll open the labia labia but they pull forward because it's just kind of a, a natural thing to do when you're trying to position yourself. So you just want to be sure that you open the labia from side to side and not do this pulling forward because when you pull forward it moves the urethra a little tiny bit out of alignment from the straight chute right up into the bladder. So that can kind of traumatize the urethra when you're trying to pass a straight catheter through a, a crooked track. So you just want to be aware of that. Now for males, it's a little bit different because they do have um, the penis to, tra uh, to traverse. And so most people will think of the penis in the dependent position, but actually internally that gives you an extra turn that you have to make internally. You can't see it. So you want to have the penis upright when you're inserting that catheter. So um, those are just some tips and we can talk more about um, catheters, but I wanted to get back to Mike's uh, question about um, 
catheterization duties. I see that uh, there's a, another uh, clarification. Some states require nurses for catheterizations rather than their unlicensed caregiver. Very problematic for services needed several times a day. Yes, um, this is kind of a new thing that's uh, coming in. Usually, um, the way it has been traditionally is that people catheterize themselves, or if they're unable to catheterize themselves, a caregiver provides that uh, process for them. So now in some uh, areas, in some states, they're requiring that registered nurses or licensed practical nurses do the catheterization duties. And this is generally speaking um, for people who have a series of infections or because of the procedure um, being thought of as a sterile procedure. Uh, but when people are in their own homes, home care is usually thought of as a clean procedure. And there's been a tremendous amount of research that has uh, been looking at this issue of clean versus sterile catheterization in the home. So when people are in their own home, they're in their own, we call it the flora of bacteria. So people become accustomed to being in their home, being with their family, being with their pets, and you build up kind of a natural immunity over time to the bacteria in your own vicinity. It does not mean that, you won't, that you're immune to any kind of infection, certainly not, but um, it, you know, just that you have more immunities to your own environment. When you go to the hospital, we know there's a lot more uh, bacteria in the hospital, a lot more uh, opportunity for infection. So in the hospital, it's definitely a sterile process for catheterization. In the rehab facility, you're kind of halfway in between the hospital and kind of halfway in between home. Most rehab facilities are uh, long-term care will err on the side of caution and do sterile technique. And that's what I think uh, Mike's talking about in the medical homes, in that some people um, gather together um, and create a home or their, their homes that are created where people can go live, but you live with other people that have medical conditions. And so it's a, it's a long-term type of uh, procedure. So some states, are, because of the grouping of people with different medical needs, there's a higher incidence of more like the hospital where you, you would have more bacteria in those facilities. And so they're, they're insisting that they have uh, trained personnel to do the catheterization. Now, this is one, something that is determined at the state level. We can fight it on a higher level. But in the meantime, they have written their rules that way. So we're kind of bound to the way that that is. Does it need to be if you have a stable household of people? If you have people trained to do the catheterization, family members learn how to do this. When you have a variety of people, then they usually want somebody a little bit more highly trained. So you know, it's it's um, it's a political issue as well as a safety issue. It just does make it far more difficult when it's time to be calf and you need a nurse to uh, do that as opposed to having your regular care attendant to do that. It makes it a, a very difficult scenario um, in which to try to navigate that system. So we have another reader in here who's been having some kidney and UTIs. And uh, she needs to order some new catheters. And she's a female but does not know the size. Do you have any suggestion? Um, I do not have an old package and that doctor that issues, issued the prescription is gone. Well, fortunately, Debbie, you are in luck in that catheters usually start out, they're measured in the French system, which is the circumference around the diameter of the catheter. So um, most catheters will come in a size 12 French. That's where people start. So if you've been catheterizing before and um, 
will just you would just assume that you're using a standard catheter and that would be a size 12 French. Now, that might be too big for you, it might be too small for you. So, um, what happens is if it the for adult people of a typical adult size, now some people are much much on the smaller size. If you're a you know smaller bone, stru smaller structure. Now, this has nothing to do with weight or anything like that. It just has to do with, you know, if you're a real petite kind of person, maybe you would start off with a, a 9 or a 10 French. But um, if you're a larger person, or adult people usually start off with the size 12 French. And so if you, if you talk to your healthcare professional and you know, just make sure that whoever you're seeing now, that they're in agreement with the standard size 12. Now, if there's a lot of leaking around that size 12 when you're doing the catheter, you might need to move up to a size 14, 16, 18. It goes up uh, generally in increments of two, so a two French. So, but usually size 12 is the standard size that most people use. Now, if you're a larger person in that you're overweight, you're still using the size 12. If you are using an indwelling catheter, it's a much different uh, scenario in that uh, the catheter that remains inside the bladder, so it often will dilate the urethra, and sometimes you have to go up in size of the catheter or the balloon that's holding it to keep uh, dry so that urine isn't leaking around. But most people will start with the size 12 French, but you always want to check with your personal health care provider to make sure that, um, you know, that that is okay for you because, you know, I'm talking to you over the computer. So I, I don't know you or your condition, but size 12 is the most common of all sizes. Okay, so why is latex allergy important to be aware of dealing with uh, catheters? It's a great question, and uh, it's to um, because uh, <clears throat> latex allergy is a, is a phenomenon that uh, a lot of people have allergy to latex. So you want to make sure that your catheter does not have latex in it because each time you're catheterizing, you're having that latex uh, rub up against uh, a mucous membrane, which is the urethra as you're um, catheterizing yourself. So um, latex is it's a, a, a rubber product, and it used to be that every just about everything in healthcare had latex in it because it was so durable and it was easy to obtain and it was inexpensive, and so everything had it. Gloves had have latex in it. Um, catheters have latex. When you go and have procedures done, if you had a colonoscopy, the colonoscopy tube had latex in it. So there's a lot of latex in the world. In most healthcare over the last 10 years, latex has almost been completely removed from the scene because so many people develop latex allergies. Not only patients, but healthcare providers also. Uh, developed latex allergies. Um, you see your healthcare provider with a stethoscope around their neck, and people would get huge rashes across the back of their neck because the stethoscope, um, the rubber of the stethoscope had latex in it. And so that latex laying across the back of people's necks gave them this latex allergy. You have an even higher chance of a, a getting a latex allergy when you're uh, touching mucous membranes. So if you have latex gloves on and you're rubbing your eye or you touch your nose or you're catheterizing or you're doing your bowel program, you can see how this exposure to the latex on the mucous membranes is just constantly with us. So over the last 10 years, we've really gotten rid of a lot of latex in healthcare. But you want to be very careful when you go to the physician or if you go to the hospital that you inform them if you have one because even just breathing the 
uh, dust from latex, if you will, any of the microfibers that would shed off the gloves, or sometimes the gloves would have uh, powder in them so you could slide the glove on easier, and then that would mix with the latex so people would inhale that, um, you know, just microscopic. Scopically, and get that microfiber on their mucous membranes in their nose. So you can see how this was just like this constant problem for people. So it, it's um, people who have spinal cord injury are particularly susceptible because they have so much exposure to it. Now, if you've been injured in the last 10 years, you probably have not had that much exposure to latex but latex is all around us. So if you're using um, a writing instrument that has those, a pen or a pencil that has that little rubber gripper on it, that's latex. So you know, if you put the pen in your mouth, or even if you're writing and you're, you're using that, those rubber grippers are fabulous. I love them myself. I love to use a pen with a rubber gripper on it, but I know I'm exposing myself to latex every time I do. If you have any kind of grabbers, we uh, tend to um, tell people who have uh, hand grip issues to get some um, foam um, from the hardware store. Uh, you need to check to make sure and see if that has latex in it. Um, for you know, if you put uh, some f a foam uh, roll uh, around your spoon or your fork or your toothbrush or if you get a toothbrush with a rubber gripper on it. I was using my toothbrush the other day and I thought, oh my gosh, this has a rubber gripper on it. I didn't even notice because you know it's just so ubiquitous to us in, in our daily use. Um, if you've ever gotten a pair of shoes, a new pair of tennis shoes, and they have that horrible kind of chemical smell to them, um, that's probably the latex in the soles of your shoes. So if you have some rubber shoes, you'll want to keep them in a plastic container or set them outside your house until that chemical smell kind of goes away because you don't want to be breathing in that latex all the time. So it's a, it's a very serious um, complication. What happens to people with latex allergy is um, that they can have skin problems where you just all of a sudden start having patches of uh, red rashy skin. It can break open. Um, it looks different than a pressure ulcer. Pressure ulcers come over those bony prominences most often. And this will just be a patch of skin. It, it doesn't have to be where you touch the latex necessarily, but it could just crop up and then your skin breaks down. It's very hard to clear up. And it can get very serious where your skin can break open and it's very hard to get these rashes to resolve. Um, the other thing that can happen with a latex allergy is you can have breathing problems. So you can become uh, wheezy, you can feel like you know your your tongue and your lips are swollen. Um, you can have you you know feel like your throat is getting too tight, and it can even lead to anaphylaxis and even even as much as people die from latex allergies. This is like really serious stuff. So we want to avoid our exposure to latex as much as possible, especially to the mucous membranes. So we always want to check catheters, gloves. Um, if we're laying on um, any kind of um, protective bedding or the, our seating uh, cushions that we might be using to make sure that latex isn't in that so we reduce our, uh, our exposure to that. So very... Um, very serious um, situation. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Oh, here's a little here's a little different question. Are palpitations, twitches in the chest area a common symptom of AD? And it certainly can be. Um, let's see. I it skipped up just a minute. Let me scroll. Okay. Um, and. Uh, gastritis, GERD, uh, also be uh, from AD. Well, it can be. The gastritis and the GERD might be a, a little bit uh, on the far end of the list, but um, gastritis and GERD could be the, the cause of uh, setting off an AD 
uh, episode. Also, irritable bowel sy syndrome as opposed to AD causing those things. It's usually the other way. The gastritis, GERD, and the IBS can certainly set off AD because what happens is in autonomic dysreflexia, the body recognizes something is wrong, but it can't react in the same way because the nerve processes are interrupted uh, due to the spinal cord injury. So um, what happens is with, I, with AD, autonomic dysreflexia, it's a medical emergency. It is telling you that something is wrong. People will end, uh, when they have AD, they'll get flushed, they'll get a stuffy nose, they get a, a pounding headache. Palpitations is certainly a sign of it. The body is saying something's wrong. Most often, it's that the bladder is over filled or that the catheter, if you have an indwelling catheter, the catheter's kinked. But most often that's the number one reason for AD, but it's certainly not the only reason. So the bowel can be full. Maybe you need to have a bowel program. Um, that irritation in the gut through the GERD and the irritable bowel can set off the AD, absolutely. Sometimes um, people will be sitting on a wrinkle, their clothes will be wrinkled up underneath them, or maybe they're wearing a leg bag, the leg bag gets too full, and then the, the um, straps that hang the leg bag onto the leg get too tight because the leg bag has overfull overfilled or your shoes can be too tight or your pants uh, can be uh, cutting into your legs. Um, so just about anything. I've even seen patients that have such severe AD that just when they're sitting, everything's fine. They're sitting in the chair, but maybe just a little wind current, the air conditioner comes on or the heater comes on, and it just that wind current blowing across their skin can set off into an AD episode. So um, palpitations, twitches in the chest, yes, definitely is a, a symptom of the autonomic dysreflexia, and could it be caused by the gastritis, GERD, and IBS? Definitely. So um, you might need to um, look into the cause of uh, what might be setting that off and then how you can deal with that. So treatment of the gastritis, the GERD, the IBS, you might not feel pain in your abdomen. Maybe you do. Um, depends on uh, your level of injury, but you might not feel it, but your body is still reacting to it. Sometimes people um, who have spinal cord injury don't necessarily get the treatment that other people do because people will say, but you don't feel it, so you know it's not bothering you. But your body still reacts to all of these things. So you do need to get that um, treated and get that under control as best you can so um, that you can help reduce that AD because you don't want that to blow out of proportion and, and get into a real, uh, real, trouble with that. So uh, Debbie's looking for her catheter and she's a tiny little person. Um, so you know you might want to start out Debbie even with a size 10 French but be sure and talk to your healthcare professional because they're going to be able to tell you um, what you should do. But uh, you're, you're a small person. You identify yourself as a small person and so um, you know, you might want to start off with a little bit. Probably a 12 French would be okay, but still check with your healthcare professional. You might want to uh, go with a, a 10 to start. Um, so um, here's a question about, uh, would you explain the process of requesting a different catheter? I would love to because it's, it's uh, it, it can become a convoluted process. But if you, dis, if you are thinking, okay, I've had a number of infections, that's probably your best argument for uh, getting a new catheter if you're having a number of infections, um, then you definitely want to talk to your provider, your healthcare professional about, you know, I'm having these um, infections. I think I need to do something more to protect myself. Um, if you're capping with a clean technique and you think a self-contained catheter so that it becomes more of a sterile process, you need to check with um, your healthcare professional who can justify the reasons why you need to have um, a different catheter system. Now, ultimately, it's going to be up to your payer if they're going to 
um, foot the bill for that. You can always get a different catheter. You can get any catheter you want. But what we want to do is to have our uh, health care payer system to foot the whole bill for that catheter as opposed to them paying for a basic catheter and we having to supply the money for the rest of it. Because as you know, when you have any kind of paralysis, there's a lot of financial needs that you have. So you want to you know, be um, a good steward of your resources. So check with your healthcare professional and have them work through with with you what the issues are, why you might need a different catheter. It's a great idea if your healthcare professional contacts your payer. They'll give you a prescription um, for the different catheter. You can take it uh, to your payer and see if they will cover that. If they say, no, I won't, we won't cover that, then you need to um, have your healthcare provider write a letter of medical necessity for you explaining to the healthcare provider the medical reasons why you need this different catheter. Um, generally, they will not pay for ease of convenience, but they'll have to have some medical reason. Certainly, if you have paralysis, that's a medical uh, reason. If you have immuno uh, compromise, so your immune system is being challenged. Well, you're catheterizing. That's a challenge to your immune system. Um, if you have some functional problems that maybe you don't have a good hand grip but a different type of catheter might make you independent in catheterizing yourself um, instead of someone else having to perform that function for you. So your healthcare professional would be able to look at you, your medical condition, and be able to write that letter. The letter then gets sent to your health insurance uh, payer, uh, whoever that could be. It could be Medicare, Medicaid, it could be a private insurance company. The response, however, and this you have to be very careful about, the response will not go back to your healthcare provider that wrote the letter the response will go to the owner of the policy. If that is you, the response from the insurance company will be sent in a letter to your home. If, um, if your spouse is the owner of your health care policy, the letter will be sent to your spouse. So when your health care provider writes the letter to your insurance company explaining why you need a different catheter, the response will be sent to the owner of the policy. So you have to work very closely with your health care provider because if they deny on the first request, if they deny your application for a different catheter, the response sent to that owner of the policy, you are only given so long, and that's dictated by your health insurance policy, to challenge that. But you always have the opportunity to challenge any ruling that your health care provider gives to you. So sometimes they just deny the first round no matter what it is, and then you have to do this appeal. So you have to be able to get that letter back to the health care provider so they can write the appeal. So it's kind of a very circular process. It makes it, it makes it very difficult, but if you have a good relationship with your health care provider, you can get on, that, on top of that and work together. Okay, so um, here's a, a, a question about what's the best strategy to use when you're starting to be able to urinate yourself just from capping. I heard about the condom catheters, but insurance only gets uh, current bag catheters now. Is switching dangerous to try? Well, yes, because um, that's great. If you're starting to get some return of function and you're starting uh, to uh, urinate on your own, um, but you still need some containment in between. So this is another opportunity to work with your healthcare professional because you're making progress. Now, sometimes um, people start urinating on their own. Sometimes it's overflow. Their bladders become too distended, and so they're just starting to put out some urine. So you need to work with your healthcare professional. You might need to have some urodynamic testing. That's a test, special testing that they do to see how well your bladder is, is functioning. Test your bladder and it, it tests the sphincter that opens and closes to let the 
urine out when it's open and closes to hold the urine in. So all of these things have to work in tandem. The whole urinary system has to work in tandem for this to work. Now I did write a blog um, earlier this month about using some reflexes uh, to be able to um, try to help yourself void. So depending on your level of injury, there are some reflexes that you can try. If you have the upper motor uh, neuron type of injury, that's people with higher level of spinal cord injuries, sometimes they can use some reflexes to help them void. So sometimes you can stroke the thighs, you can pull uh, pubic hair, and you'll have a reflex where automatically urine will be expelled from the bladder. Some people will notice when they're doing their bowel program and they uh, stretch their anal sphincter that some urine will be expelled. This is a good opportunity to be able to start uh, using these reflexes to empty the bladder on its own. Now, just because you're having a little bit of urine that you're putting out, you need to make sure that your bladder has completely emptied itself because it could be just, um, your bladder could be having a spasm and urine could be coming out, but it might not necessarily be uh, avoided urine. It could be just a spasm. So um, if you're having some incontinence, you do need some uh, external catheters. They're called condom catheters. Um, you do need to have something to contain that urine so that you're not getting wet and um, you know, increasing your chances of uh, skin breakdown. So uh, is it switching catheters dangerous to try? Yes, unless you have somebody who has really uh, looked at your, the way that your bladder uh, system is working to see if you're actually um, voiding or if you're having spasm, to see if you're having some reflex uh, voiding. Um, you can capitalize and use those reflexes, but you don't want to just bank on that working and, and thinking, oh, okay, now I have voided and so my bladder is empty. You may have only voided off half of your urine in your bladder. You may have only um, um, eliminated maybe 100 cc's, but maybe there's 200 cc's still in there. You do need to drain your bladder so that the urine's not sitting stagnant in there because the longer it sits stagnant, the more opportunity there is for um, uh, bacteria to grow in that urine. And so we don't want, if it's if your bladder's uh, spasming and the urine is being uh, eliminated because of the spasm, the spasm could also be causing that urine to back up the other way into the ureters which go up into the kidneys. That's a one-way valve. It, urine can't go back up into the ureters because that's going it, to, it's not the ureters and the kidneys are not vessels that will stretch to hold urine. So you don't want that urine to go back up into your kidneys. That's going to give you kidney damage and that's going to be huge trouble for you later down the line. So if you're having voiding from spasming, it could be going out the urethra, which is, looks like void, but it could also be going up into the kidneys. Um, so generally what happens is um, people who are getting return of function will attempt to void and then they'll catheterize to see if their bladder is truly empty. And so you'll want to work with your healthcare provider to see how many times you need to do that, to make sure your bladder is emptying properly, to make sure that, um, that the bladder is working in, in the way it should be and not that you're uh, causing more damage to yourself. So, this is one of those situations that's very, very, um, can be very dangerous to you. It's fabulous when it happens and the bladder starts getting some return of function. It's about one of the best things that can happen to your, you in your life and it's uh, life changing because, you know, you don't have to do all this catheterizing anymore and return of function is always wonderful. Um, but still, it can also be a very dangerous time if you leap ahead and just say, oh, I'm voiding, so I don't need to do this. You can r run into some severe problems with kidney damage, infections, um, just all kinds of complications. So be sure and check with your um, 
healthcare provider. If you are having return of function, your healthcare provider can order some external catheters for you, and then your insurance will probably um, cover. I, not your insurance, so I'm not the one to say, but most insurance will cover the external catheters while you're uh, getting this recovery of function. So be sure and check with your health care provider for that. Um, so um, here's Mike is talking about um, the external catheters, uh, the latex. Um, uh, he likes a catheter that's silicone and has the adhesive. Let's talk about those external catheters um, for a while because um, we haven't really talked about those at all yet. But for males, there are catheters that can be worn on the outside of the penis. It looks like a condom, so they fit right up over the penis. There's some adhes adhesive tape that's used to secure uh, the condom on. So, uh, and then there's a, a tube at the end, so any urine that's voided gets voided out, goes out through the tube and is collected in a leg bag. So you can um, uh, have uh, elimination of urine at any time if you have a spastic bladder and urine is being squirted out at unpredictable times. Here's, this is a way that you can uh, contain the urine and so that you don't... Um, have an accident, you don't, you know, you don't have um, soot in uh, urine or anything like that. So um, external catheters can be extremely helpful. There is no external catheter for women. Now, I'm, as soon as I say that, I'm going to take it right back um, and say, I guess that there's been many uh, external catheters devised for women, but they've all run into some kind of complication with erosion of the meatus or, or some kind of problem because of the female anatomy being more internal. There's not really any way to secure these and they've tried all different kinds of things but right now we don't really have anything effective for females uh, to be using. For males we have these external or condom catheters. Um, because the urine collects in the condom part, the uh, sheath around the penis, um, the urine then tends to stay on the penis, so you need to use some kind of skin prep, and that's what it's called, skin prep. Um, it's a protectant. It looks just like an alcohol pad, but it's got some substance in it that, that keeps the urine from uh, eating away at the skin on the penis. So you need to um, be sure and use something like that. You need to change the catheter um, on at least a daily basis, if not two times a day or more, so that uh, the urine, so that the penis has time to air, so that you can clean the urine off of it, because it, it again, it should come out slightly acidic, so you don't want to get that eating away at your skin of your penis. Now, um, the tape that's used to secure the catheter, there are many different kinds. Some wrap around the penis, um, and when you do that, you want to wrap it um, not in a circumference around the penis but in a spiral around the penis because you don't want to make a constriction. Even if you have a spinal cord injury, there's um, blood flow that goes around, in and out of the penis so you can be, you can, if you put the tape in a circular, you know, uh, end to end in a circular fashion around the penis, you can cause a constriction and even uh, like a tourniquet and even uh, uh, lose your penis. I've actually seen people who have had to have their penis amputated because they put the tape too tight or they put it like a tourniquet around. So a spiral fashion going up the penis so that, so that the condom is then uh, pulled up over this tape or it can be on the inside or it can be wrapped around the outside, but so that there's some give in the tape so that you don't get this tourniquet effect. Very important. Now, one of the problems with external catheters is if you have a large amount of urine that comes out very, very quickly, it, the catheter is el elastic and so it will expand and then the, the tube will eventually drain off the urine. But if it comes out real fast, sometimes it blows the external catheter off. And that's why people try different types, different brands of external catheters to see what really works well for them. So um, 
you know, this is just something that you want to experiment. If you just kind of have a slow leak all day, usually that won't happen, but people will talk about their catheter blowing, their external catheter blowing, and then you've got this huge uh, wet spot in your sitting and urine. So it can be a problem. So you really need to get the technique of applying these catheters correctly. Um, so that's just something to think about. Um, just beware of that happening and, and be willing to try different ones and then look very carefully at how you apply the tape. Um, be sure you follow the package direction uh, completely and precisely because you know if you blow a catheter and you're wet and then people are like, well, I'm going to put this on, I'm going to put the tape on tighter, that's not really the answer. Putting the tape on correctly is the answer because tighter is only going to cause that tourniquet and we don't want anybody to um, have to have another amputated penis. That's a huge huge issue. Um, just another thing to follow up on that, some people will elect to have um, ostomies. They'll elect to have, um, um, instead of catheterizing themselves, that they just have a conduit surgically uh, created from their bladder to their um, to the outside through their abdomen. And so you really want to think about this. It's a surgical procedure. It's a lot easier for bacteria to get in. Sometimes you need to have one of these procedures, and it's just the way it is. It's for your general health, and your uh, physician might be recommending that to you. But um, you know, think about these procedures. If it's just a matter of convenience, try to keep, you know, Nothing is as good in the body as what was naturally given to you. So some people say, oh, I don't want to bother with these catheters. I'll just wear a bag on my abdomen. That will be so much easier for everybody. But it's not necessarily healthier for you. So if your health condition is such that you need this, please, by all all please go ahead and have this done. However, if it's such that it's just a matter of convenience, it's not to your benefit to have some of these procedures done. Now, the most common one is the supra, supra pubic catheter, where a little hole is inserted just uh, right up above the pubic bone, and a catheter, an indwelling catheter, is placed into the bladder right directly through the abdomen. Um, many females have this done because catheterizing a female in a a wheelchair can be quite tricky because you have to spread the legs and you can accomplish this by um, uh, pulling the leg up and out to the side. Um, there's some various different things. You can take an arm off one side of the leg rest to kind of pull the leg over to the side. But it is difficult. Females have a far more difficult time with this. Um, something that a lot of women are doing now, which you know, is entirely up to to you and your healthcare professional. But one um, uh, technique that was devised that started out in the pediatric world, where um, uh, it's a surgical procedure where the appendix is uh, removed and then uh, the appendix is used to create a route from the navel of the belly button. Uh, down to the bladder so that when women catheterize, they catheterize through their navel or belly button. The catheter goes into the bladder from the top down, I guess, instead of from the bottom up. And uh, it's called the Mitrofanoff procedure. I've seen some males who have it. Males don't usually need to have it because they have good access um, readily for catheterizing. So um, there's a variety of things that can be done, but you know you always want to think twice about a surgical procedure. If you are doing something um, the way that you're doing it, it's working out fine. Maybe it's not as convenient as you would like for it to be, but if it's working, then go ahead and use what you have. The most natural way is always the best way, but there are other options um, should you need something for medical or you know, if if you're a female and you can't go to work because you can't catheterize at work, um, you know, you might want to consider uh, another option. So um, here's a question about UTIs and um, the effectiveness of antibiotics. 
And so um, this is the thing about antibiotics is that they are specific to the bacteria that they treat. So you may have an infection and the next time you maybe have another infection, it might be the same bacteria, just coincidentally. So you can take the same antibiotic. Sometimes you'll notice that you go and you get one antibiotic and then the next time you get another one, the only, a different one, the only way that you can tell is to have a laboratory test analyze your urine to see what that bacteria is in your bladder. Now, bacteria, uh, antibiotics come in different strengths. They're really called generations. So the lowest uh, level generation is the bacteria that you want to have. And those are usually the penicillins. A lot of people have an allergy to penicillin. Those are lower generation. They um, treat some basic bacteria. But bacteria are very clever little um, pieces of organisms. And they learn to mutate. So you, that's why, you know, when you get an, an antibiotic, it says take the full course of the antibiotic. Because the way the antibiotic works is that it will start um, killing the bacteria that's in your bladder or wherever your infection is. And then it will get the bacteria under control. But the bacteria is still there. And should you stop taking the antibiotic, it will come back again. But it will have mutated into a different bacteria. <clears throat> so bacteria is very good in the mutation process. So um, that's why you need to take your antibiotic for the full and complete dose because they know that is how long it will take that antibiotic to completely get rid of that particular bacteria because that bacteria doesn't want to die. It wants to live. And so if, if some antibiotic comes into your system, it's going to try to mutate into something else so it can continue to live. The next time you have an infection, you might have the same bacteria. You might have a different bacteria, and that's why um, the different that's why you get a different antibiotic. But it can only be t told if you have an infection. Sometimes you might feel like you have an infection, but maybe you have a soap irritation. So the only way that you can really tell is to do um, a an analysis on the urine to see if there's an infection there and then what, it, what is the infection. So if you have a bacteria and you, it's the same bacteria in your infection every single time, you take an antibiotic and it treats it, you take, get an infection again, you take the same antibiotic and it treats it, after a while, that bacteria is going to mutate into something different. And it's going to learn how to get around the, and resist that antibiotic. And that's why you get um, those resistance. And that's why the effectiveness of antibiotics becomes less and less over time. So as you, um, if you have multiple infections, you want to find out what, what the source of your infection is. If they're bladder infections, what can you do to prevent another bladder infection from occurring? Well, you can drink fluid, keep your system flushed out. You can try um, the acid uh, juices, the cranberry and the apple. Now if you're diabetic, that might be too much sugar to take in. Um, with spinal cord injury, if you're not moving around a lot, that might be too many calories to take in. So sometimes people will try the cranberry tablets. Um, you can get them at the health food store. They don't have the sugar in them, but you get the effect of the cranberry. You swallow a little tablet. It works through your system and keeps um, your... Um, your urine more acid. Another thing that really helps um, uh, with UTIs is that when you're sitting, uh, your bladder is not moving around much. When you're mobile and you're up walking around, the urine, urine kind of, if you think about carrying a glass of water and it has ice cubes in it, and you're walking along and you hear the ice cubes sloshing around in there, well, your bladder does the same thing. As you're up and walking around and moving, that urine's moving around so it doesn't have opportunity for bacteria to grow and multiply in there because it's constantly sloshing around. So if you can't get up and walk around and move around, you can still provide mobility. 
certainly by doing some of the activity-based therapies that provides um, some movement and activity to your bladder. If you don't have access to the activity-based um, therapies, and I'm hoping so soon that everybody will, uh, but if you don't have opportunity to get uh, to that, just even moving your legs and doing your uh, passive range of motion, um, rolling from side to side, doing your wheelchair push-ups. This all provides movement in your pelvis, which makes that bladder, the urine in your bladder, sh slosh around. So you don't really need to do anything expensive. You don't need to um, go out and buy new equipment or um, do something, you know, you know, buy a lot of product. You just need to move around, and that's one of the best things you can do to help yourself um, with uh, UTIs is uh, move that bladder around. So as you're doing your pressure releases, um, kind of the collateral benefit of doing a pressure release is that you're also helping the movement in your uh, abdomen, which is helping keep you free from UTIs. It's helping move uh, stool through your bowel. When you do your passive range of motion, the same thing. It's, it's um, what what I call a collateral benefit. You're doing something to help yourself. You're preventing pressure sores. But by the same token, you're doing this activity which is really helping you um, give you the collateral benefit of helping uh, eliminate um, ulcers or um, infections. So anyway, I'm sorry, but it is time. So for us to end, as I, I told um, our moderator, Julie, at the beginning, I could talk about catheters all day long, and indeed I have. So if you I have can't any believe questions, you have. I know, I could. <laughs> and I could go on for longer too. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to write into the blog. And have a happy Thanksgiving. Yes, I want to thank everybody for their great questions today. I know there's a couple questions we didn't get to. So please feel free to um, leave those questions for Nurse Linda um, on our online paralysis community. And you can get there um, right to Linda's spot um, by going to ChristopherReeve.org slash nurse. And she is there um, every Wednesday evening, and she answers those questions that people have been leaving. Um, so please do it. She's, she's on, actually on more than I know she is. But please, she, she's very good at answering. And also um, look for our next um, live chat with Nurse Linda at the end of December. It's like Wednesday, December 30th. Um, so save the date for that, and you'll be looking for that. And this presentation has been recorded, and I will have the link to view the presentation um, on our website, let's say by tomorrow, uh, end of day tomorrow, so that you can review everything that Linda talked about. So thank you everybody. Have a happy Thanksgiving.